Hi brothers and sisters, Jerry O'Donnell here with Four Angels Messages. We're about to uh, enter into a study called Beholding Strange Women. Before we get started, let's take a moment in prayer. Our Father, thank you so very much for this time to spend with you again in thy word and I pray that your Holy Spirit will help us to spiritually discern what we're about to study and I pray that it enter into our hearts and minds transforming us into the people you would have us to be for this hour in Jesus name we pray amen all right the title of this message and where we're going to leap from happens to be in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 23 specifically. So let's go there, Proverbs chapter 23. And let's look here in Proverbs 23 at the verses 29 and 30. It says here in Proverbs 23, 29 to 30, Woe, or I'm sorry, let's try that again. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contention, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. These are very strong verses against the use of alcohol, that we should not be consuming such. But that's not where I'm headed with this. I would like to take it on a spiritual basis where we should not be drinking wine, especially mixed wine. And again, this is on a spiritual basis. There is another being that is offering the world wine. And people are being very drunk with that. That being happens to be none other than the Antichrist, specifically the whore of Babylon, which is found in Revelation 17, 5. But let's go to Revelation 14 right now. Come with me over to Revelation chapter 14. And let's make the connection that this is a prophetic reference out of Proverbs. Revelation chapter 14 is where we're headed. And we're going to look here in verse 8. Revelation 14, 8 says, And the, there followed another angel saying, Be, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she, and focus on this, made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Focus on the word she, but make the connection that she's offering wine when we were just told in Proverbs that we're not supposed to be drinking wine, especially mixed wine. Now, wine in the Bible, I just want to share with you, um, is a generic term to refer to grape, uh, the juice of the grapes. Depending upon the context thereof, the wine is either the pure grape juice or it could be the alcoholic version. What we read in Proverbs a little while ago happens to be mixed wine and that is very much alcohol. On a spiritual basis though, we are told that to beware of the doctrines uh, of the Pharisees, as as far as that is concerned, Jesus made warning of that. Um, if I may, I, I just had this thought come to mind. Let's go to Isaiah, if you would, please. Uh, my favorite reference, because in Isaiah 28, we are told how to understand doctrine, and then we're given a warning before that. And that's where we make the connection that wine is doctrine. And then we'll get to, uh, to the point of defining what mixed wine is. But let's first 
establish in Isaiah 28 verse 9 whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts and of course we know in verse 10 that for precept must be upon precept precept upon precept line upon line line upon line here a little and there a little so that's a proper way to understand doctrine but prior to that there is a connection with alcohol in verse 7 it says, but they also have erred through wine. And we're not necessarily talking physical wine here. And through strong drink are they out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink, and they are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Yes, Physical alcohol will have an impairment that causes people to think that they are acting in one manner when they really are not. They err. They're not good in their judgment. But the fact that very shortly thereafter, we are told about the doctrines, there's a spiritual application here. And so when we drink of the doctrines that come out of the world as opposed to God we are drunk and we stumble at making judgments for instance society tells you to follow your heart society tells you that you should be able to love anyone that you want and basically to stand in the way of that love is an unkind act of which is condemned by God in certain situations. Now, the danger back in uh, Proverbs about drinking mixed wine is the fact that we are taking the doctrines of the world, and, and I don't mean we as us personally, but the world in general, especially in a religious sense, is taking the doctrines of the world taking the doctrines of God and mixing them together, making the world drunk. I mean, one example happens to be the story of creation and where they try to take evolution of the world, the literal interpretation of Genesis 1 as well as uh, 2, and try to mix together so that it comes off that we're not at war with that false science um, we can have the same understanding it's just that Christians use different verbiage as opposed to the scientists and therefore we are in uh, we are connected together we're, we're not at war and that's a, as far as you can get from the truth um, because it is not eons of time that these things transpired but rather six literal days the seventh one being the sabbath and that's how we get our week that we do follow there's no other explanation thereof now what is the danger of drinking of this mixed wine that mixes the ways of the world with christianity the doctrines of the bible and makes some type of an amalgamation here come with me to proverbs back to proverbs that is chapter 23 if you would proverbs 23 where we were but this time jump down to verse 33 where it says in proverbs 23 33 thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things a woman in the bible when um she is of God we are told that God has compared the church basically to a delicate and comely woman the word Zion is used in if you were to look up those words and then Zion basically is defined as thou art my people so the people of God is, are compared to a woman but when she goes after, as Israel and Judah did, they play the harlot. 
which is also a strange woman, if you would. Not a calmly delicate woman, but a strange woman. We should stay far away from strangers. We're told that as children to do so. And yet, as adults, so many people are visiting strange women on a regular basis. And what do I mean by that? Well, if, if a calmly and delicate woman is the pure church, as described in Revelation chapter 12, then a strange woman, a harlot, one that's an apostasy that happens to be drinking of the ways of the world, trying to mix it with Christianity, happens to be all the other denominations. So the strange, and notice it was plural, women uh, in Proverbs 23.33 means that when you are willing to accept the ways of the world mixed with Christianity, there's only one result, and that result happens to be beholding what the doctrines are of the strange women, these fallen churches. This is how so many churches have pastors that are unbiblical. That includes women's ordination. That includes uh, being married uh, to a gender that's not acceptable of found in the in the Bible in fact uh, to practice such as an abomination so how we go from an abomination to hey I'm your pastor now is an amazing thing but because it is accepted in society and pushed to us through the media the churches have fallen even further than they did earlier just a couple centuries ago so a couple centuries prior to that they were all about hey the bible and is uh, where we get our doctrines from and if we're not getting it from the bible then why is there any different denominations we all should just do whatever we are told to by the well by the catholic church there should be no schism whatsoever but there is among true believers because we do believe that the Bible alone gives us our doctrine. And so let us not be drinking influenced by those teachings. And unfortunately, they have come into this church where the atonement is completed at the cross, negating 1844, um, where we are also just saved by grace and uh you know commandment keeping uh sabbath keeping it's overrated um we just choose to go to church on on the seventh day that's all preparing us for an easy move over to sunday keeping as will as is prophesied will happen to the church and yet people will insist that the church is going to go through, but prophecy says, well, if they're going to accept Sunday, they're accepting the mark of the beast. The church is the church of heaven, and we are to be members there. To be members there means that we keep the seventh day Sabbath and follow all that God tells us to follow. Those that had similar beliefs, organized a church in 1863 to make transactions with the, the world, but it was never intended to be uh, in an organizational sense as the authority representing God as the Catholic Church does. Uh, we are told that it is the assembly of the general conference of people that actually bring this in but even that has now become corrupted i mean come on when you're trying to push women's ordination in every gathering uh every five years trying to push this through and feel that hey you're you're, you're getting there because every time the vote comes up um the the difference percentage wise becomes narrow and narrow and narrow to the fact that uh, I think the next one that is to be held 
it uh, possibly could actually pass. I'm not going to get all mixed up in that because it's it's a bunch of nonsense. What I'm saying is that the church, the structure, will not go through. Read the quote on the books of a new order. It is going to fall. Uh, the actual church of God does not fall, but it does. Um, in other words, the structure is going to be swept away. And uh, we are going to have to be faithful. The purpose of going to church is outlined to us in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 4. And if this is lacking in the church, one needs to leave the church. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're headed. And this is why we gather to, together. Now, I want to establish, this is in addition to my own notes, I want to establish that we are talking about the church by reading verse 11 first. I intended to read Ephesians 4.12, but let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where it says, And he, the Holy Spirit, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, all of which are found in the church. What are they supposed to do? So when the pastor gets up there to sermonize, the Sabbath school teacher gets up to teach, the evangelist comes to town, um, Ellen White prophesying, and if there be any future prophets that are of God, not pretending as we've already experienced, as well as the missionaries, what are they to do? According to verse 12, it is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we are to go to church. And if you feel like you're getting beat up because um, sin has been addressed and you just so happen to have been connected to that sin, uh, it is a good thing that uh, you went because you are to feel that way as long as the solution of Jesus Christ has been also provided, who can clean us up, who can make us into the saints that we are supposed to be for this hour and forevermore. <clears throat> but instead, what we hear from these churches is that I'm not saved by the law, I'm saved by grace as they enjoy adultery. Some say, I'm saved by faith and not the law, as they lie and steal. What these preachers have done, and we know that uh, what I said is true, because you just look at some of the news articles, uh, someone's caught with a prostitute, so, uh, someone uh, lied to the government and didn't report all their income, and... and um, things like that. Let's go to Jude. The book of Jude. It's only one chapter long. And we are going to look at, at verse 4. So Jude. And let's look here at verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. That's into the church. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They are ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have here is that grace has been turned into uh, something it's not supposed to be, and yet it is killing the congregation because in reality, they are making allowance for sin by telling people that you will sin up to the second coming and then there, there's some type of magical event that will happen that now makes you perfect. No, we are to be chiseled here in the quarry called earth. When we are taken to heaven, we are fit into place as a stone building the temple. All spiritually, of course. There is not going to be the sound of a hammer um, or any noise in the assembling there, we're going to fit right into place. All the 
chiseling that needs to be done is now. And that's why we go through all kinds of issues and trials and temptations and things like that so that we can prove to the rest of the society of angels and other unfallen beings that we can be trusted to live throughout eternity without bringing up sin because they don't want to go through this again. That's their whole big concern. And what we are being shown um, is the power of God because we ourselves cannot clean up ourselves. It's by the divine power that God grants to us that we have now been empowered to live the godly life. Now, <clears throat> according to 1 John 3, 4, there is only one definition of sin, and that is breaking the law, transgression of the law. And if we're not, as Paul says, uh, do we make void the... Um, Void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Do we continue to sin so we can gather lots and lots of grace? God forbid again, he says. Those are very strong words from the Bible. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand how today uh, no one takes you seriously if you're using all your strength, all your might to keep, when you are angry at a situation, to keep the language clean. Unless you're using foul language, <clears throat> they don't take you seriously. Well, this is as foul language as the Bible gets. When Paul stresses, God forbid, that is the ultimate before crossing the line into foul language. That is the final line when someone says, God forbid. And we, it's too bad society doesn't realize that it's a whole lot easy, a whole lot harder to actually keep the tongue when in anger than it is to let these supposed colorful words to clutter up our statements and possibly end up regretting what we say later while they just, you know, flippantly allow those words to fly because no one takes you seriously unless they're not in there. Now, <clears throat> come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and notice how what I've said throughout this message gets summarized here. There's going, only going to be two sides. And those that believe the lies that are visiting those churches that are influenced by their material even, and this is why I refuse to read material from other denominations, um, unless it can be absolutely proven without using the usual uh, attack phrases that what I believe is wrong, until it can be proved, I'm not moving. I moved once because I saw the error of my ways. I choose to stand on the Bible. And with that in mind, we see that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the very first verse, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit exp uh, speaketh expressly that in the latter times in which we live at now, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. And that's where all the other denominations are right now. The doctrines of devils are filling those other places, and they're waxing worse and worse. How do I know that? Because churches are yet dividing over issues that are being brought up. As some denominations and mainline denominations adhere to what society demands, some in the church says, no, 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 I'm not going along with that. And so then they form their own separate um, denomination, basically. I mean, 
you add up how many flavors of Methodism there is, <clears throat> Baptist as well, and many other denominations. Yes, the Seventh-day Adventists have their um, <clears throat> number of uh, splinter groups as well. And um, <clears throat> we, we need to not be visiting those that have the doctrines of devils. And by the way, you can have the doctrine of devils by having all the correct doctrines and not able to handle them properly. I'll leave that as it is. But there are some Seventh-day Adventist breakoffs that um, uh, so strict of authority. Uh, um, I'm not saying that there should be an allowance of, of God, but there is obviously a coldness there, and God's not with that. <clears throat> Where we should be, come to Revelation chapter 14, of which this next verse everyone should have memorized. Revelation chapter 14, so I won't even wait very long here. Verse 12, the Bible says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and, ha uh, and the faith of Jesus. We are to be commandment keepers. We are to be patient saints. And we are to have the faith of Jesus. And it's going to take a whole lot of faith to make it through these days, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> As more and more women come forth offering wine, mixed wine. Um, the first is... Uh, straight up doctrines and mixed wine is really mixing it with the world that you cannot tell a difference and that's where most of them are the mega churches go this way very quickly how do you think they become mega uh, because they are told or tell their congregations that uh, oh you can continue in your sins uh, because you are saved by grace and once saved, always saved. And even if someone says, oh, yeah, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. As they live in sin, ask them, are they saved? And if they say yes, then they do believe in it. So I leave you with that, <clears throat> with the warning. Stop being influenced, if you are, uh, by the wine, the mixed wine of the other denominations in any of its form. And that includes... The movies that they put out. Oh, but it's a religious movie. I mean, the story of Noah, which mixed evolution in there and created strange things happening. I think angels come out of rocks or something like that. It's like they're transformers or something like that. Um, even the Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, a lot is questioned in that because of the allowance that uh, Hollywood takes on certain matters. Um, just just a uh, amalgamation of the world is what it is. So be very careful of what's influencing you. And uh, may you stay sober and be diligent because the devil is certainly looking for those that are weak in the faith, that he he may devour them. Let us not be weak in our faith. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for the warning messages that you give us. Help us to be sober and diligent. May we be responsible with the time we have. And may we also work the work that you would have us to work seeking and saving that which is lost. Help us, I pray, to see all that we need to see and share what we need to share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. God bless.